Welcome back. So, I assume now that you've seen lectures 4 and 5, which have to do with heat and radiation, but what do we do with all this radiation once we get it? Well, that's the topic of this lecture. And so this lecture is based off of pages 43 and four, through 46 in the textbook, so make sure you at least take a peek at those. And let's begin. So, our first goal is to understand how our land and atmosphere actually use solar radiation. Then we're going to talk about absorption, reflection, emission, and so on. And then we're going to talk a little bit about how clouds impact all of this. So, once radiation from the sun reaches the Earth, it does one of two things. It's either absorbed or it is reflected. Now, as far as absorption is concerned, 19% of all the radiation that reaches the Earth from the Sun is absorbed by the atmosphere and the clouds. Another 51% is absorbed by the ground. So that adds up to 70%. So 70%, 70% of what comes down is emitted or is absorbed by the Earth. The remaining 30% is reflected by the Earth. 20% of it by clouds, 4% by the ground, and 6% is scattered by the atmosphere. And this is actually what gives us colors. So things like why the sky is blue, why are clouds white. So much of that has to do with the fact that these different molecules are actually absorbing this, this light and then scattering it, and scattering it in different colors. We'll talk more about that later in the quarter. So again, here's how this works. So if we have 100 units of radiation coming down, 100 units of radiation coming down, of those 100 units, 51 of them reach the surface and are absorbed. 19 of them are absorbed by the atmosphere and the clouds. And then the other 30% are reflected. 4% by the surface of the Earth, 20% by clouds, 6% by the atmosphere. And this is also done through scattering. And we actually have a fancy name for this 30%. We call this albedo. We're going to talk more about that in a couple of minutes. Now, let's go back to absorption for a quick moment. As we talk about absorption, some objects absorb almost all the radiation that hit them. And that's really crucial. The more radiation an object absorbs, the hotter it becomes, and therefore the more radiation it emits. Earth's surface is a good example of this. Earth's surface absorbs almost all of the radiation that hits it. And therefore, it emits back almost all the radiation that it absorbs. A black t-shirt is another one. One of the reasons why the t-shirt is black is because it's not emitting any visible light. Hence, it's black. Other objects only absorb some wavelengths while being completely transparent to others. A good example of this would be the windows in your car. The windows in your car do a really good job of letting sunlight pass through, which is a good thing. Because if light couldn't get in to the windows of your car, you wouldn't be able to see the outside. If you're, weren't, if you're not able to see the outside, you can get into a lot of bad accidents. On the other hand, those same windows do a really good job of absorbing and trapping in long wave radiation, which is one of the reasons why your car gets so hot in the middle of the day. Because short wave radiation from the sun comes in, it's absorbed by the interior of your car, that heats your car up, your car gives off more long wave radiation, and those same windows absorb it, heating your car up. We call things like this selective absorbers. And 
a few key selective absorbers in our atmosphere are greenhouse gases. Now, they're not the only ones, but they are some of the key selective absorbers. The way greenhouse gases work is they're transparent to shortwave radiation. They're transparent to sunlight. So sunlight just passes through them. No problem. They don't absorb it. They don't do anything like that. They just Sunlight just passes through them. On the other hand, long wave radiation, this is the stuff that the Earth is emitting, ends up getting absorbed by them. Hence, they heat up. They emit more radiation themselves. That keeps the Earth warm. So, again, greenhouse gases let sunlight in, but they don't let radiation from the Earth back out. This keeps the Earth warm, and that's kind of a good thing. Now, there are several greenhouse gases, and each one of them absorbs different wavelengths of radiation. In order, in order to understand what, they, what different wavelengths they absorb, we can look at something called an absorption spectrum. And that's this right here. So I'm actually going to have you do something a little bit different. Instead of looking at the very top, let's look at the bottom here. Anywhere where you see areas that are almost completely shaded purple, those wavelengths are being absorbed almost entirely by the atmosphere. On the other hand, areas where you see very little purple, these areas here are actually areas that are more transparent. These are wavelengths that are more transparent. Now that we have that, let's look at some of these different types of gases and what they're transparent to versus what they absorb. Nitrous oxide, for example, you see it's primarily transparent to visible light, shortwave radiation, and much longer far infrared radiation. However, wavelengths between five and roughly seven and a half microns are absorbed by nitrous oxide. Guess what? The Earth actually emits these particular wavelengths. Hence, nitrous oxide is a greenhouse gas. Methane, on the other hand, it absorbs wavelengths of roughly four microns and again, roughly around seven microns. Even though it only absorbs very little wavelengths, these are still wavelengths being emitted by the Earth. So we're still concerned about this. Oxygen and ozone, they absorb lots and lots of very short wave radiation. So um, radiation such as UVA, B, gamma rays, and so on. So thankfully, oxygen and ozone in particular block us from those. But they also absorb radiation around 10 microns. And so that actually causes, that actually has a greenhouse effect. Then there's water vapor, which you can see it absorbs substantial amounts of different long wave radiations. And then there's carbon dioxide, which also emits, or which also absorbs very long wavelengths that are being emitted by the Earth. Grand total, this is our total atmosphere here. And this region here between roughly 7.5 and 12.5 microns is what's called the atmospheric window. It's at this wavelength, at these wavelengths, where radiation is able to escape Earth. And thankfully we have this because otherwise a lot more heat would be trapped in. It would be a lot hotter here on Earth. However, the more we increase concentrations of these gases, the more radiation is going to be picked up by them, the warmer the Earth gets. Now, absorption isn't the only thing that happens. I also mentioned scattering and reflection. Now, before I get into that, let me briefly mention what's called transmission. Transmission is just transparency. Radiation simply passes through the material. On the other hand, we have scattering and reflection, 
Reflection happens when a certain wavelength just bounces off the object. So it hits the object, bounces off the object. So approximately 24% of sunlight that enters the Earth's atmosphere bounces right off. Another 6% is scattered. And in scattering, basically what happens is a beam of radiation hits that object, hits that gas, and is then scattered in many different directions. Now, we call the percentage of radiation that's reflected or scattered off a material, that material's albedo. The Earth has an albedo of approximately 30%, or if you use decimal instead of percentages, 0.3. And we'll talk more about albedo um, when we get into climate change, because albedo actually has some major implications on climate change. But let's, let's uncover it a little bit more. So albedo is the fraction of light reflected by an object. White objects, such as white t-shirts, white blouses, white dresses, and so on, have high albedos. They do a really good job at reflecting sunlight which is one of the reasons why you should wear them on hot days. Wear light-colored objects because they have high albedos. On the other hand, dark objects such as a black t-shirt or a dark pair of jeans have very low albedos, meaning they absorb a lot of sunlight. So if you've ever heard the whole white after Labor Day thing, this is why it's actually mentioned because white objects have high albedos. They're designed to reflect sunlight, keeping you cool. Black objects have low albedos, they absorb sunlight, that warms you up. So you don't want to wear black on a hot day, you don't want to wear white on a cold day. Here are three circles here. And if you take a look, the lighter object, this lighter circle, this white circle, has a very high albedo. These darker circles have lower albedos, increasingly lower albedos. So it looks something like this. The lighter the object gets, the higher its albedo. Here's a table with many different albedos. Um, fresh snow can have an albedo as high as 95%, which is why the presence of ice and snow on our Earth is actually very important, because it can actually increase the amount of sunlight being reflected, which cools our Earth. Clouds also have a very high albedo. Thick clouds as high as 90%, which is why they look a brilliant gleaming white from space. Thinner clouds have lower albedos, but this just gives you the overall albedo of many different objects and as well as different planets. Here's a nice big snowy picture. All of this snow is very fresh, this is a high albedo area. Meanwhile, over here, you see a dense forest. While this area can still reflect a lot of sunlight, compared to the snow here, this has a much lower albedo. Now, with all of this said, the Earth has an energy budget. As I just mentioned, it absorbs 70% of what it gets from the sun. It reflects 30% of that stuff. And what it absorbs, it keeps. That's its income in a very real sense. And just like your income or my income, we have to properly budget it in order for it to be useful. So let's talk about this for a little bit. So Earth has two sources of income. Its primary source is shortwave radiation from the sun, the stuff that's not reflected. However, that shortwave radiation also gets absorbed and emitted by other objects on Earth, such as clouds, such as um, gases in our atmosphere. And these emit radiation as well. Remember Oprah, everything emits radiation. So these radiations can also, these 
different wavelengths of radiation can also be considered income. They're emitted by clouds or the atmosphere, and they also reach the surface of the Earth. On the other hand, just like you have different expenses, Earth has different expenses as well. Remember, 30% of what hits the Earth is reflected. That's a, a part of Earth's energy budget. Earth also emits a certain amount of radiation based on its temperature. Remember the Stefan Boltzmann law? The remaining energy that Earth gets from the sun is dispersed in one of three areas. Either sensible heat flux, which is conduction and convection, so either it conducts heat into the lower atmosphere and that causes convection to occur, Latent heat flux, we'll talk more about this next week when we talk about water, and then heat that's absorbed into the ground. This is called ground flux. During the daytime, heat is entering the ground. At nighttime, heat is escaping the ground. So each one of these things represents spending. Now, just like your budget, Ideally, it should be balanced. And when it's balanced, the Earth's temperature stays the same. When energy in equals energy out, the Earth's energy is balanced and its temperature remains the same. But what will actually happen to the Earth if it receives more energy than it gives off? Or what would happen to it if it received less energy than it gives off? Well, in the case that it receives more than it's giving off, it'll warm up. Just like your bank account. If you make more money than you spend, your bank account's going to grow. The opposite is true, too. If the Earth releases more energy than it brings in, it cools down. Just like if you spend more than you make, your balance declines. It goes down. Now, the last thing I'll talk about for this lecture is latitude. Now, we haven't talked much about latitude in this class yet, but latitude is simply the distance in degrees from the equator. So the equator is the midpoint between the North Pole and the South Pole. The equator has a latitude of zero degrees. The poles have latitudes of 90 degrees north of the equator and 90 degrees south of the equator. Well, the sun is almost overhead at the equator. It varies a little bit from season to season. We'll talk more about that in the next lecture. But for now, let's just say that the sun is almost overhead at the equator. In the case of the sun is overhead at the equator, that means that sunlight coming from the sun is coming in directly into that area. As a result, regions that are near the equator get lots of heat because sunlight that's coming in is concentrated over a small area. On the other hand, if you live near the poles, the sun is usually very low on the horizon. In this, hate, and in this case, any heat that hits those regions actually spreads out over a larger area. Therefore, they get much less heat. They get much less heat. Um, a good example of how to do this, if you have a flashlight at home, turn off the lights in your room, turn that flashlight on, hold it directly over something. Hold it directly over so that the beam is shining straight down onto that something. You'll notice that the beam is very intense and it's concentrated over a small area. Now take that same flashlight and now begin to lower it and tilt it so it's lower on the horizon. If you look at the beam it begins to spread out and it begins to dim. That's what's actually happening at the poles. That sunlight's now spreading out over a larger area and it's less intense.
So this is how it looks. Near the, or sorry, near the equator, you get one beam of radiation coming straight in overhead. It's concentrated over a small area. On the other hand, if you are near the poles, you get one beam coming in and spreading out over a larger area, and it is a lot less concentrated, and therefore it is a lot less intense. This is why areas near the equator are usually very hot year-round. Areas near the poles are much colder year-round. This actually results in an interesting, um, an interesting situation where if you live near the equator, you actually have a surplus of heat. You actually get more heat than you give off. On the other hand, if you live near the poles, you have a deficit of heat. You actually get less heat than you give off. In the event that there was no heat transfer whatsoever, what would actually happen is areas near the equator would warm up substantially, whereas areas near the poles would cool down substantially. This would create kind of a problem here on Earth. The equator would become unlivably hot, areas near the poles would become unlivably cold. Wouldn't be a good thing. Now the good news is we have a heat transfer. Surplus heat from near the equator is actually transferred to these higher latitudes, keeping them much warmer. Now, the last thing I'll talk about is the effect of clouds on all of this. Now, clouds are very bright, consisting of many, many, many water droplets. And they have an effect, they have one of two effects on radiation. The effects are called the albedo effect and the greenhouse effect. So let's talk about them. The albedo effect is present during the daytime. Clouds typically have a very high albedo, anywhere between 60 to 90 percent, meaning they reflect most of the sunlight that hits them. What that does is that greatly reduces the amount of sunlight that passes through them and makes it to the surface of the Earth. This makes the Earth a lot cooler. As a result, on a cloudy day, the Earth is much cooler than it otherwise would be. But this impacts only during the day. If you actually look at night, there's no sunlight coming in. So there's nothing reflecting off the clouds. However, remember, at night, the Earth is still giving off radiation because it has a temperature above absolute zero. As a result, as a result, it's giving off radiation. These same clouds are made of substantial amounts of water. Water is a greenhouse gas. And so what actually happens is, at night, since there's no sunlight, clouds aren't reflecting anything, our Earth is always giving off radiation, clouds absorb this radiation, heating them up, and then they emit it back down to the Earth, keeping the Earth warm. So at night, these clouds act like a blanket. They keep the Earth warm, keeping cloudy nights much warmer than clearer nights. So as a result, during the daytime, sunlight is reflected off these clouds, keeping the Earth cooler. At night, infrared radiation from the Earth is being absorbed by these clouds and emitted back down, keeping the Earth warmer at night. Now, I should stress really quickly before we wrap this up that during the daytime, yes, there still is a greenhouse effect of the clouds. But remember, during the daytime, there's far more light coming in from the sun than is escaping via long wave radiation. When you put clouds into the mix, when you put clouds into the mix, what this actually causes is this greatly impacts the amount of sunlight coming in, which is why even though there's still some radiation being trapped, 
the Earth is still cooler than it otherwise would be. Now, that's it for today. Um, here's a brief review. Incoming shortwave radiation is either absorbed or reflected. Um, objects that absorb some things but don't absorb others are called selective absorbers. Albedo is the percentage of sunlight that's reflected by something. Earth's albedo is close to 30%. And then the Earth has a balanced energy budget. Incoming equals outgoing. If the Earth ends up receiving more energy than it's releasing, it warms. If it receives less energy than it's releasing, it cools. Sunlight is more intense at low latitudes, less intense at high latitudes. And then clouds make days cooler and nights warmer. Now next time we're going to talk about seasons and how the tilt of Earth's axis relates to seasons. But until then, I'll see you next time. Have a great afternoon or have a great day or evening or wherever you're at. And I will talk to you next time.